Uh, with us today is Dr. Roxana Moran for her grand rounds on DAPT and triple therapy, update on the latest evidence for patients with CAD undergoing PCI. Dr. Moran completed internal medicine training at the University of Connecticut, followed by fellowships in cardiovascular disease and interventional cardiology here at Mount Sinai. Dr. Moran is now a professor of medicine, cardiology, and population health science and policy at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and serves as Director of Interventional Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials. She is a founding physician and Chief Scientific Officer of the Cardiovascular Research Foundation and a co-founder of the Academic Research Consortium and Women in Innovation. Dr. Moran is a prol prolific researcher and author, the recipient of many prestigious awards, and she continues to contribute to cardiology on a global scale. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Moran. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you all for being here and spending your morning with me. I promise to be brief but and efficient, but, but very complete. Um, um, dual antiplatelet therapy and then triple therapy in our patients who require all our anticoagulants is really a mainstay of what it is that we are doing. And while you are observing my important disclosures, it is important to note that we are deciding on these patients who are beyond dual antiplatelet therapies or even triple therapy in combination with oral anticoagulants. But I'm going to tell you right up front that I'm not going to give you any important, huge new recommendations because we still are unclear what the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies should be and what we should be doing in patients who require oral anticoagulants. But let's understand what it is that we um, uh, in the cath lab are dealing with when we're seeing a patient with an acute coronary syndrome as opposed to a patient who comes in with a stable um, coronary artery disease or a stable presentation. In the acute situation, it's a very different story. There is a thin fibrous cap that has been ruptured with thrombus formation and it's a thrombus laden artery and a lot of the work Actually, I'm humbled to be seeing, uh, of course, as usual, uh, the one and only Dr. Kohler here, who really has given us so much to think about how to treat these patients with acute coronary syndromes, with uh, initially with the glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors, and really, really thinking about how to do this and how to do this well as opposed to a stable coronary artery disease where this is a whole different pathobiology. And so why is it that we should be treating these two entities the same with the same dual antiplatelet therapies? What should be the duration? What can we do with the new, um, uh, uh, more potent agents that are becoming available? For how long should they be on there? Is aspirin even needed in these, in these patient settings? And so those are the questions that I hope to address today. So as I said, the antiplatelet uh, agents are really, really focused on the platelet, obviously, to inhibit aggregation, migration, adhesion, and very much so in the chronic state, we're thinking about the ADP receptor antagonists that we now currently have available. And the ones that comes to mind is obviously clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. And we are going to be talking a lot about those patients who are requiring this in the combination of the antiplatelet regimens that we are working. And the big question is that every time it comes to mind, you send a patient home on dual antiplatelet therapies, when can you stop it, if ever? What should be the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies? So during this lecture, what I'm going to do is to talk to you about the safety and efficacy of prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies, this trade-off that we as clinicians are giving to our patients and thinking about in preventing ischemic complications, are we exposing them to the hazard of bleeding, and what is that price, and in whom do we have to be more careful? Uh, it's kind of a bank account, if you will, and you really have to manage it extremely well. We also, I also want to share with you that there's been huge progress now in um, our newer drug-eluting stents that are currently available, and the safety of those stents are unprecedented, and we are got to be thinking above and beyond the stent 
which is a very small piece of a patient. I think it's really important to note we're talking about the patient and not the stent. I'll talk to you about that. And then finally to say you guys are all fine and that physicians actually are the ones who are going to make sure that they take all of this in and make the important judicious judgment of what it is that they should be doing because not one size fits all and uh, the judgment rests back to you as the clinicians to make the important judgments. So let's go through the safety and efficacy. If it was okay to just give dual antiplatelet therapies forever to a patient, it would be the way to go, right? You inhibit the, this is what we want. We want to prevent ischemic complications. And what do we know about the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies? I could tell you that there are several studies, and look at the number of patients in these, in these studies that are looking at early, you know, three versus 12 months, uh, six versus 12 months, three studies there, six versus 24 months, three studies there, 12 versus 30 or 36 months, and four studies over there. So basically, lots of studies trying to understand the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies between early or late, but the problem is not a single one of these are completely powered to answer the question that you as the clinician need to know for how long should I be given the patient. But what we can do is to try to do a pooled analysis of these data to see can we come up with some kind of an answer that makes sense so that the clinicians can make judicious ju uh, uh, decisions. You can't walk away from the most important trial of this group, which is the DAPT study. These two trials collectively enrolled and randomized in a double-blinded, placebo-controlled fashion. Everyone else had open label. Here's a double-blinded, placebo-controlled uh, trial, the DAPT study. It's important to understand the, 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 uh, the context of this study for your patients. These were patients who did who received a stent, a drug-eluting stent, or a bare stent, but mostly a drug-eluting stent, this is the one, the 10,000 patients who received the drug-eluting stent, who were free of any kind of events on dual antiplatelet therapies at one year. So it wasn't the early event. The early event patients are all out of here. These are patients who tolerated, who took dual antiplatelet therapies, and at one year, they were randomized to receive um, dual antiplatelet therapies as they were receiving or aspirin plus placebo. That's the design of this study. And the question, the major question was, is there a benefit to extend dual antiplatelet therapies beyond a year? There is nothing else that this study answers. It's not at the time of PCI. It's not when your patient gets the PCI and goes home and that you get to decide. It's that one year visit in your office when the patient has done well on dual antiplatelet therapies for an entire year. Should I continue or not? And when we looked at this, the double primary endpoint, there was a two co-primary endpoints of major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events and stent thrombosis, and there was a significant reduction in those patients who tolerated a year and went on to receive it for another year or so, for 30 months or so. A full, these patients had a much better um, result. Most of this was driven by reduction in myocardial infarction. The stroke and ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke was no different, but if this was so good, and so great to reduce myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis, we have a, a blip here in mortality that is not really making sense. It's not going in the right direction. You always should be looking at the details and the composite is one thing. You also want to know the, the uh, important components of the composite endpoint. Is it all going in the right direction? Does it make clinical sense? And if this was so great to reduce ischemic events, why is it that we are having an increase in mortality? In fact, the ischemic events were not just in the stent. And while we, one of the co-primary endpoints was a stent thrombosis, most of the myocardial infarction benefit was actually outside of the stent. 55% of the patients 
uh, 55% of the MI benefit was outside of the stent. It was for those new lesions that were going to be forming. So again, a very important finding that it's not the stent we're treating, it's the patient we're treating. But I think here's the answer of prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies for beyond a year, is that moderate or severe gusto bleeding, which is almost near exsanguination, was severely, was much more higher and moderate and severe, you can see that here, as was bark type 3, which is really like a Timmy major bleed, was significantly higher, 1.1% absolute increase. So very similar to the reduction in ischemic events was the increase in bleeding events. And what, how do I make sure that I'm doing the right thing, giving the, the prolonged dual antiplatelet therapies to the right patients? And in fact, our meta-analysis, this is the one we performed, and Gennaro Giustino is one of your uh, colleagues here. He's the first author of this very important, very highly quoted uh, Jack meta-analysis, shows that yes, if you prolong dual antiplatelet therapy, you surely will reduce myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis in the long run. You absolutely will. But if you shorten it, if you don't prolong it, you reduce bleeding and maybe all-cause mortality. And what's more important? I mean, I think mortality is right up there, right? We want to, everything we do is to reduce mortality. And so why is this going in the wrong direction? Well, let me talk to you about the trade-off between the thrombotic and bleeding events and why is it important for you as clinicians to be thinking about the patient and not just going by the top line results of a clinical trial, that you still have to pay attention and take in the patient's risk factors, the context of the, of the, of the disease presentation and what it is that they are doing, and then making a decision on their very small thing, dual antiplatelet therapies, for how long should I be giving it to the patients. It's really important. The trade-off is as such. We did a back of the envelope um, uh, in this exact meta-analysis. And we did the very, very good analysis. And we said, if you put it all together, for every stent thrombosis you avert with prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies, you're approximately causing 2.1 clinically significant bleeding. That's the estimation that you are basically doing. And, and how important is that? Well, bleeding is important. It matters. Bleeding matters. We often didn't think about bleeding. We were so focused on reducing ischemic events as we should have been, and we were able to make an impact on reducing um, important ischemic events and treating patients aggressively with antiplatelet regimens. The pendulum has swung now in understanding what it is that we are doing. Post-discharge, after the patient goes home, the bleeding is very important. The early trials focused on 30-day outcomes. These new trials, the ADAPT DES study that we worked with Greg Stone on, where we looked at platelet reactivity, and that was our number one issue. But what we really cared about was both bleeding and ischemic events. And we went after the bleeding events, ascertaining those events, finding if they had GI, GU bleeds, or received blood transfusions. And you know what we found? We found an important, a very important um, uh, finding that post-discharge bleeding, especially if you receive the transfusion, had, had a hazard close to five times higher of mortality if you bled outside of the hospital. And it was very similar, that mortality, to that of, in fact, it was twice as much of that of post-discharge myocardial infarction. And while our focus is always and should be in, in, in reducing ischemic complications, we can't just give carte blanche to everyone because you will cause extra bleeds, and those who bleed will die, have an important mortality. Now, many have said, well, those, that's because the bleeders are the sicker patients, et cetera, et cetera. But no matter what, the answer is that you cannot give it to everyone. You have to be thinking about this in a more judicious fashion. What about the new generation drug-eluting stents? In fact, in the original DAPT study, 
about 55% of those patients received a first generation DES, which is obsolete by now, not being used at all. And in fact, when we did this meta-analysis, we found that there was a significant attenuation of the risk of stent thrombosis with shorter duration of DAPT in patients who received a second generation DES. In other words, the currently available DES takes away that important benefit that you might gain by prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies to avert stent-related complications. What you're gaining is outside of the stent in those patients beyond a year or beyond even six months, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that. In fact, when we look at the DAPT study and just focused on the currently available stents, that subgroup of patients, 30 versus 12 months, take a look what we're finding. Stent thrombosis, all of a sudden, the, our confidence intervals were no longer powered to show the important the important relevant reduction, and in fact, it's touching the line of unity very, very closely. Bleeding is significantly higher, and mortality now gains a statistical significance in prolonging dual antiplatelet therapies if you're so worried about just the stent. So we've got to think outside of the stent, and we've got to move ahead, because one size does not fit all, and we have to make those important, um, important comprehensive clinical evaluation that looks at the ischemic and the bleeding risk. And then beyond that, you as the clinician collecting and understanding things about patients that are not in a clinical trial case report form, like the neurological status, like their expected adherence, like malignancy that might come, or a socioeconomic status of a patient. Those things only you as the clinician can know about your own patient, and you will bring that together into the equation to make the important decision for these patients. Because after all, we're not treating the, pa the, 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 the stent. I hope it's about the patient. The stent is really, really small compared to the entire vascular tree of that patient that you're trying to protect. So, is there any benefit to prolonged DAPT? Am I sitting here telling you that based on the paper presented by our group that we should be shortening dual antiplatelet therapies on everyone? Well, the answer is no to that as well because we certainly don't want to scare you about bleeding to ration the care and then increase ischemic complications. What I want you to do is to focus on who might benefit who might benefit for this prolonged dual antiplatelet therapies? And there is answer there, there's some answer there, from the original Charisma study that was almost a decade ago presented, over a decade ago, we knew that the Charisma study was a study that looked at patients for secondary prevention of adding clopidogrel to an aspirin-based therapy. So it was aspirin alone versus aspirin plus clopidogrel. And the original paper, the full paper, was negative. It didn't show a, a, an important reduction. But in secondary prevention for patients who had peripheral vascular disease, coronary disease, those sicker patients, there was, there seemed to be a benefit. It was a subgroup, secondary analysis, always questionable when your main trial is negative and you focus on your secondary endpoint that all of a sudden is positive. That's a whole different lecture. I'd love to give that to you guys at some point. But there is some precedence that perhaps there is some benefit. And this Pegasus trial, which was a very big trial, focused on the secondary prevention in the post-MI stable patients, post-myocardial infarction, with other risk factors factor profiles, randomized 21,000 plus patients with a background of aspirin to placebo, ticagrelor at 60 or 90 milligrams, followed these patients for a long period of time. And what they did show that if you actually gave patients dual therapy at the two different doses, you are able to reduce ischemic complications in these patients, death and my stroke was reduced. When I look at this and I say, if it takes you 21,000 patients to show an absolute reduction of about 
I don't know if p this p-value, no matter how many zeros it has, is of any value at all, because you really still have to understand the give and take of this. And in fact, bleeding is exactly in the opposite direction, exactly to the same percentage of increase in, in uh, redu reducing the ischemic complications, you increase bleeding, which brings us back again to the fact that we still have to think about this. So we published this. Um, again with Gennaro Justino, um, in, in looking at an algorithm. Can we have an algorithm? We put this in the Lancet, we were invited, an algorithm to manage patients with dual antiplatelet therapies. And what we said is that after a PCI, there's a period where we believe there's a mandatory uh, timing for stent-related complication aversion so that we want to reduce the thrombotic complications associated with that stent in the first maybe three, maybe six months. We don't know what this is. This is still questionable in the current era. Isn't that sad? Almost 20 years of stents out there and we don't know exactly what this duration should be. But beyond this, once we get to the patient, you must assess the patient for bleeding and ischemic risk and understand better you should, whether you should stop or continue dual antiplatelet therapies. And it makes somewhat of a sense, and I'll go through all of this. They also, we, other people, such as the DAPT um, investigators, they said, yes, there, it looks like there's some price to be paid. Let's figure out how we could make judicious Good, good clinicians and good, good clinical judgment on the data that we currently have. Let's come up with a score. So they came up with an integer score that combines the bleeding and ischemic risk in the same patient, and it kind of uh, gives you, a, if you have a low DAPT score, then the numbers needed to treat to prevent ischemic events goes up to 153, where the number to harm a patient with a major bleeding event comes down to 64. But if you have a high DAP score, then that number becomes really small, 34, to, to avert a, an important ischemic event such as, such as myocardial infarction or stent thrombosis, and the number to cause bleeding goes up exponentially. So it seems like this would be a really good way to individualize therapy. But I it would behoove you to note that this comes from the DAPT study, so it's not at the time of PCI, it's after a patient, it's in the patient subgroup of patients who were really good in, in tolerating an entire year of dual antiplatelet therapies. It's not the real world, it's part of the trial. What real world evidence do we have? Well, we here at Mount Sinai performed the Paris Registry. This was a 5,000 uh, patient study in whom we Everyone received a drug-eluting stent, and we followed these patients to two years looking at DAPT adherence. And we looked at discontinuation, disruptions, which meant whether the patient stopped without any guidance versus interruption where a patient needed to interrupt for some period of time. And through that, Dr. Baber, who's one of my colleagues, came up with this important risk score that gives you an integer score for both bleeding and ischemic score, and then you can plot it on your own in your, um, on this plot to figure out where the patient fits. And anyone who goes uh, below this line is gonna have a harm. Anyone above this, this, this imaginary line will have a benefit, and your patient would fit somewhere in here where you could make an important judgment of what to do. And this is also becoming very, very soon available in an app store where you could get that. Beyond DAPT and Paris, there's also precise DAPT. So there are several risk scores and calculators for those of you who love your smartphones and don't want to look at patients and talk to them. <laughs> and I hope that we actually go beyond that, even though we developed one of those risk scores. And I actually love this algorithm more than any other. Why? Because it actually makes you think about the patient. And Deepak Bhatt uh, presented this at Nature Review's cardiology. And what he says is, look at the patient-related factors, anatomic factors that make an important difference, and stent-related factors. And then you can decide less than 12 months or greater than 12 months, depending on a patient's 
presentation, stable versus acute coronary syndrome, a patient who has a history of bleeding or has high risk of bleeding, shorter, a patient who has diabetes, renal dysfunction, congestive heart failure, et cetera, longer, a short lesion, single vessel disease, shorter, a long lesion, small vessel bifurcation, the types of stuff that Dr. Sharma and Kinney do upstairs, longer duration, a if you have a second generation, which is currently available, a shorter duration, if any of your patients probably received a bioresorbable scaffold, then probably a longer duration, long stents, multiple stents, et cetera. So you could see that you can do a judgment in that. And then understanding still, even with this, that there are many patients that have both of these and overlap the risk. How do I make the judgment there? And there, the plot thickens and it's much more difficult. I can tell you that in the generations of the stents, we're now moving into the third generation of the stents, trying to come up with newer technologies to even reduce the stent-related complications further. The Evolve study is looking at this new stent, the Synergy stent by Boston Scientific, where the stent has a bioresorbable polymer such that after about three months, the polymer is gone, the drug is delivered, the stent is just a bare stent or nothing there to cause chronic inflammation. We also know from the, the, the uh, earlier studies, one of the most important studies, the BioFreedom drug coated stent, which is not available in this country as yet, has used surface modifications to to, Im to get embed the drug within the abluminal surface of this stent and, and put in the drug there, and there's no polymer, so it's polymer-free, so, such that they actually performed a, the largest trial in the patients we usually exclude from clinical trials, the leaders free trial, where patients at high bleeding risk, those who could not tolerate even, a, even beyond a month of dual antiplatelet therapies were randomized to receive this new stent versus a bare stent, which is what we're usually giving our patients. And what did they find? That actually the drug-coated stent, as expected, reduced the need for revascularization of the target lesion, so restenosis was reduced. But importantly, very much importantly, death MI and stent thrombosis, although underpowered in this 2,500 patient study, was reduced when you gave that drug-coated stent. It's important that everyone in this trial only received one month of dual antiplatelet therapies with this new drug-coated stent. That stent will be coming to the United States. We also know that the current Zion stent that everybody is receiving, uh, a lot of people are receiving, also the floral polymer seems to be extremely safe and a short duration of dual antiplatelet therapies are underway for that particular stent. So we're shortening the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies for stent-related complications already with improving stent technologies. On the bioresorbable scaffolds, I want to just give a small note that these are not being used. They're off the market. There's not a single one available today. But there was a period of time in the last year, for about a year and a half, when these were available. At Mount Sinai, I think we placed it in 45 or 50 patients, no more than that. And if any of you have a patient, who has received the bioresorbable scaffold, we would say the current trials are not giving you the duration. We do know there's an association with increased stent thrombosis as that stent starts to dissolve. So we are recommending a prolonged duration of dual antiplatelet therapies in those patients as they hopefully can tolerate this. And so remember that uh, that's really sort of what we're doing. So all of this evidence has fed into an evidence review that was based by, um, by um, Dr. Biddle, Dr. Ba Dr. Baber, and Dr. Bradley, who actually informed us on the writing committee of the guidelines for DAPT, for the duration of dual antiplatelet therapies. This committee found that there is no question that if you prolong dual antiplatelet therapies, you're going to reduce um, reduce uh, ischemic events, but that 
if you shorten it, you will save bleeding and maybe even mortality. And because of that evidence review, uh, we were able to come up with this schematic for the DAPT guidelines currently available. And this is what you need to know. These are the guidelines. If your patient with coronary artery disease presents with an acute coronary syndrome, that patient, regardless of what you do for them, whether they are treated medically with a bypass surgery or with PCI, which is the majority of the patients, class one indication is to give them one year of dual antiplatelet therapies. Remember, I showed it to you. It's a ruptured plaque. There's high inflammation. There's thrombus-laden artery and probably elsewhere. And that patient is rich with events and will continue to have more. So we need to really paralyze the platelets for at least a year on these patients. And so as such, here we are for this uh, uh, level of evidence. The level of evidence is not fantastic here. It's really based on cure PCI, which is almost two decades ago. But no one has refuted that we should not, we should shorten dual antiplatelet therapies, although some uh, new data is coming in, not enough to change the guidelines recommendation. When the patient presents with stable ischemic heart disease, if they undergo PCI, and they receive a drug-eluting stent, the class one indication has shortened the duration from 12 months now down to six months with an out, with an ability to give you an out even at three months if your patient is at high risk for bleeding. And beyond the six months, you can only consider this with a 2B evidence based on the bleeding and ischemic risk of the patient. So in other words, you may consider prolonging beyond, and you're not obliged to do so. There's not enough evidence to do that in stable ischemic disease without harming the patient. So you really consider that in the high ischemic burden patients. And here in ACS, also beyond 12 months, it's a to be considered a 2B recommendation for those patients. What's coming down the pike is even more aggressive in trying to say, we do need the potent antiplatelet regimens. And is there something underway here that is not allowing us to give the, uh, the, the potent agent its ability to work without having important bleeding events? And what we have done in the past is we've stacked therapies on what we're comfortable with. Nobody wants to withdraw aspirin. No one. Everyone's afraid, believes that aspirin is the wonder drug, and it might very well be. And it's no one is to say you should stop it. But what we do know is that maybe, just maybe, we can allow the potent agents to do their work if they're not stacked on top of the great GI sluffer aspirin, which is not a great antiplatelet regimen. And as such, we designed this study here at Mount Sinai as the sponsor of this study in high-risk patient cohort in whom a, the patient is given a, in aspirin and ticagrelor therapy. We let them go on for three months to receive this dual therapy, low-dose aspirin and ticagrelor. At three months, we evaluate these patients. And if they're free of events and they've done well and they have been compliant, we then randomize them to aspirin plus ticagrelor, which is their usual medicine that they were taking in the last three months, versus ticagrelor plus placebo in a double-blind placebo-controlled fashion. No one knows what the patient is receiving. This is the twilight study. This is the study that we are running here. Usman Babur is the head of the clinical coordinating center. I am the study chair with um, an incredible, incredible team behind me running this trial in over 125 centers, 9,004 patients who are already enrolled. We finished enrollment December 31, right on time, with a randomization of close to 8,000 patients, we believe we'll get about 7,000 plus patients randomized in this trial to answer the question, can we take aspirin out of the equation after three months to be able to prolong and give these patients good dual antiplatelet therapies because these are the patients who need them.
They're getting high risk PCI. And if you're putting aspirin on top of it, maybe you're stopping their duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. You stop everything. And you're not letting them have the benefit that they deserve to have with these important potent agents. And so the results will come out. We'll be finished with the randomization this April and we will be presenting in April of 2019. And I couldn't be more proud of my institution for, uh, for sponsoring this, and my team and everybody here that we are going to be on the map for this important pivotal trial. Now, having said that, others have tried to do the same. The global leaders uh, people looked at that biomatrix stent, that, that drug-coded stent that I was telling you about with Biolimus A9, and they said, our study was so good in leaders free and the high bleeding risk patients that we believe we can have an experimental strategy with aspirin and ticagrelor in real world patients. And after a month, we're going to take away the aspirin and have them just receive ticagrelor alone versus the reference treatment arm, which is what the guidelines are telling us to do with ACS versus non-ACS patients and et cetera, et cetera. And as such, it's very important to note that Six, the 16,000 patient study has finished enrollment and it's in its phase of follow-up and no one has stopped anything, but this is an open label study. Very different than ours as a double blind. We are the only double blind placebo controlled um, study withdrawing aspirin in patients. So to conclude in this area, prolonging DAPT will reduce complications, shortening it will reduce, uh, will reduce bleeding. So if you want to, you've got to make sure that you actually make an important assessment about bleeding and ischemic events. The new generation DES definitely have reduced a lot of the ischemic related, stent related complications. And prolonging DAPT after that mandatory period is sort of the clinician's choice based on the risk profile of a patient. And we really have to be thinking about non-stent related events. This is not about the stent anymore. It's about the patient evaluation of their athero atherothrombotic risk and their bleeding risk. And the safety and, therapy and, 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 and efficacy of aspirin withdrawal is something we are looking at. And I'm going to show you a lot about that in triple therapy. So just moving quickly to oral anticoagulants and DAPT, this one becomes even a bigger conundrum for us as clinicians. The challenge in AFib patients undergoing PCI, which is about 5 to 10 percent of the patients, thank goodness it's not more prevalent than that, but they come to the cath lab with atrial fibrillation and they have a risk for stroke, which is added now to the risk of stent thrombosis when we place a new stent. The problem is that oral anticoagulants don't work very well for preventing stent thrombosis, and antiplatelet regimens, the dual antiplatelet therapies, don't work very well in reducing and preventing stroke related to atrial fibrillation. So what's a girl to do? I say girl because there are women cardiologists out there that we have to make these decisions. We have to put it together and give this combined triple therapy to these patients. What does that do? Exposes them to that horrible risk of bleeding. Imagine what bleeding looks like now when you add oral anticoagulants to dual antiplatelet therapies. And if you have a patient who's anemic, who's a frail little old lady, you're going to have a problem with bleeding complications. So this is the conundrum that we are facing. And what we as clinicians must do is to prevent these ischemic complications, but also prevent and not cause harm and giving them extra bleeding events. So how do we do this? It's a very difficult issue. There is no question that adding that triple therapy brings the risk of bleeding almost infinitely high, three and a half, seven, you know, four times higher in this patient population. Well, the Dutch, they were the brave ones. For the first time ever, the Dutch said, let's not send home everyone on triple therapy. Let's keep the aspirin off of this equation. Everyone was in awe. How can you stop aspirin? We need aspirin to prevent stent thrombosis. And they took 573 patients, randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to dual therapy with clopidogrel alone and Coumadin versus 
the triple therapy regular arm. And everybody said, well, this is such a small study. It was actually, I remember when it was first being presented, we all said, oh, it's a poster. Oh, oh no, it was withdrawn. Oh, it's an oral presentation. And oh, all of a sudden, it was a late-breaking trial because it was unbelievable that by just taking the aspirin off, they reduced bleeding by 64% in this patient population that was so rich in bleeding events without increasing the ischemic events. Now, it's only 573 patients. In fact, ischemic events were reduced. That don't pay too much attention to that. You're not going to reduce ischemic events when you take away, um, you know, this is because it's underpowered. We don't know about that. But importantly, there wasn't a signal of higher ischemic events. And so, while this study doesn't change anything, it makes you to rethink, to say, can we do a non-aspirin arm? And it made us feel more comfortable with the Twilight study, to be very honest with you. And it made the novel oral anticoagulants come into the space and say, we are brave enough in one of the arms of the Zeralta patients to take away the aspirin and give them a lower dose of Zeralta in combination of clopidogrel. This was the pioneer study, which randomized the patients. One of the arms had no aspirin. The second arm has aspirin, clopidogrel, but a very low dose of 2.5 milligrams POBID of Zeralta, which is not available, but soon will be based on the new study, I think, that we just saw. And then the triple therapy arm. This was a very difficult study to do, and, and it looks very confusing. But we tried to, on the executive committee, emulate the real world because often clinical trials happen and they're not translatable to the real world. The mishagas you're seeing happening here is because this is what's going on. The clinicians might want one, six, or 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapies in combination with a new oral anticoagulant, and the same with the vitamin K antagonist. So we allowed them to make those important real-world choices on their patients. And we ended up in a New England Journal of Medicine because we did show that you can prevent bleeding. So here was the Wust-like arm. That was the Wust Dutch study, no aspirin. The Atlas-like, this was a, a study with acute coronary syndromes where they combined these three agents together. And then the triple therapy arm. And as you can see, uh, doctors made different decisions between one, six, and 12 months of having the patients on, an, on, an, on a clopidogrel uh, therapy on top of their novel oral anticoagulant or vitamin K antagonist. So it was very, very interesting and very much real world. And we did show, look at the bleeding events in this patient population. Clinical significant bleeding in the triple therapy arm. And remember, most of them, a lot of them, 50% only had six months of triple therapy, was 28, 27%. And by just introducing a novel oral anticoagulant with or without aspirin at a lower dose, we were able to reduce the bleeding events significantly where the number needed to treat was only nine or 10 to avert one of these important clinical significant bleeds. And so this was a very, very important study. And by the way, even though we were not powered to show the difference in ischemic events, we did not have a signal of increased ischemic or stroke events in this patient population. And in fact, we showed that all-cause mortality and um, uh, all-cause mortality and, and hospitalizations were reduced significantly with this regimen of taking out the uh, vitamin K antagonist, introducing a novel oral anticoagulant, and in the cases of Reva plus P2Y12 inhibitor, re getting rid of the aspirin in those patients. So again, another option, this has been introduced in the European guidelines already, and we published this. Other novel oral anticoagulants have also been studied in the same regimen. The Debigatran in two different doses, 150 and 110 milligrams BID, was examined against the triple therapy arm with 
clopidogrel alone without aspirin in the redual study in 2,500 patients randomized. And here, they too showed that when you take aspirin off, you can reduce bleeding significantly with both doses of dabigatran without increasing ischemic events. And so when you pool these three meta uh, these, these randomized studies, you're seeing that you can actually reduce bleeding without increasing uh, the important uh, ischemic events such as stroke. Again, it's not, it's again individualized. Some patients you might need the triple therapy arm for. Finally, the Augustus trial is looking at apixaban. I love this trial the most. Both myself and Dr. Halpern are on the executive committee of this trial. It's the largest number of patients with a background of clopidogrel therapy presenting with an atrial fibrillation or an acute coronary syndrome who are randomized to warfarin versus apixaban, Eliquis, and then a second randomization, so it's a two by two factorial design to aspirin versus placebo. So a true WUST-like arm with a placebo will be looked at. And it's, I think to me, it's the best design study. We're over 3,700 patients already randomized in this trial, and we should have results in the next year or so. The Untrust study has the important um, adoxaban at 60 milligrams a day without aspirin with a P2Y12 inhibitor versus, again, Coumadin uh, with or without aspirin and P2Y12 inhibitor in here as well. This is un, un, uh, continuing to, uh, to enroll patients. Uh, we do not have, that. we only have the low dose available here in the United States, as you all know. And finally, to let you know where we are with the guidelines, we're nowhere. No real recommendations despite all of these trials because none of the trials are completely um, uh, dictating exactly what we should do for how long. And what the only thing that the, that the guidelines are telling us as class one is to remember that an oral anticoagulant is a must. You cannot stop that in a patient who is having, who has atrial fibrillation and has a high CHADS-VASC score. I hope everyone knows that, even if they undergo PCI. And that combining the uh, potent P2Y12 inhibitor with like Prasagrol or Ticagrelor with an oral anticoagulant is a class three possible harm, no benefit for those patients because you will expose them to undue bleeding. So with that, those are the top line best results that I can give you in both dual antiplatelet therapies and triple therapies. Thank you so much for being here and for your attention. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for a terrific lecture and, and your good work. Uh, second comment is uh, your recent, recent uh, statement about nowhere. And that takes me to uh, my favorite subject about age and research. I'm not talking about old people. <clears throat> I'm talking about studying age even in the cells of the intima. I see very little attention to that issue. And everyone knows that age, in many ways, is the strongest correlate with every illness, let alone cardiovascular. So could you comment on why there's so little attention uh, to uh, especially in the basic science of cardiology, uh, to the uh, impact of age on this disease? Well, I can tell you that as a clinical researcher, I pay a lot of attention to age uh, because it is absolutely one of the most important predictors of everywhere, I mean, ischemic and bleeding events. I do agree that we know very little about the aging uh, endothelial cells and, and um, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a basic scientist and I'm not, I don't pretend to be one, but I have not seen any and I don't know if there are basic science uh, 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 researchers and scientists here who could, who could shed a light. Uh, or uh, I can tell you that in platelet function studies and the studies that I'm doing with Dr. Bataman, uh, we will put age into the equation, and I I'm, I'm, I'm don't know exactly what he plans to do in the twilight study in looking at 
He's doing a very, very important sub-study here at Mount Sinai, uh, the only sub-study that is um, looking at uh, these platelet functions and the function of the platelet reactivity, et cetera, in his chamber, in the Batamon chamber, as well as in the um, uh, using the different assays. And I'm sure he might have something to say about age, but I, I, I can tell you, you have, you're preaching to the choir. I think uh, age is incredibly important and we need to continue to understand that better. Uh, so you mentioned uh, adherence sort of briefly at one point. My question really uh, is, what percent of your patients actually adhere, let's say 95% of the time? Does it make any difference whether you're dealing with one, two, or three drugs? And to follow up on Dr. Liebau, what's the effect of age on adherence? So, unbelievably important question. And in fact, we performed an entire study that did nothing but to focus on adherence. And that was the Paris study. And I didn't have a chance to present to you all of the data that we have available. Adherence is one of the most difficult things to measure because we are dependent on a patient's recall. And I'm personally, uh, I'm not very compliant myself in even antibiotic therapy for two weeks. I'm, I'm unable to, to, to stay on it as, as the best way and my recall is not great, especially for a busy or an elderly patient population. So having said that, we did find in the Paris study that non-adherence early on after stenting based on non-compliance uh, when we was High, highly associated with early uh, stent-related complications such as myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis. And this occurred in the lower socioeconomic status patients, those patients who had bleeding events early on, or those patients who just uh, stopped taking the medications uh, voluntarily because they just didn't bother to go and, and fill the prescription. Um, adherence is incredibly important. I imagine that we're going to get better now that we're more electronically savvy. Um, I understand now that there are um, GPS systems that can figure out whether you open the bottle or whether or not the patient actually took the tablet. Um, those things are coming. Um, in sh short of that, what we can do is to continue sending text messages and and what have you to these patients to try to improve adherence. But adherence is a major, major issue. And in fact, the Academic Research Consortium is writing an entire paper on how to look at adherence and non-adherence and how to define it, how to, how to, how to uh, get better at it. And, and it's a very, very important topic because none of these things will work if the patient doesn't take them or adhere to those treatments. So thank you for that question. Time for one more. So first, congratulations. Uh, these are monumental undertakings, each of these studies, and the fact that you've contributed so insightfully in the design of so many is really remarkable. Uh, my question is, why are the people who bleed dying? Uh, are they dying of their bleeds? Are they dying because the doctors are taking them off their, all of their anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications, and really, as a subgroup, you mentioned, well, maybe people say they're really sicker. Well, now you've got many hundreds of them, so you should be able to tell whether they really are sicker. So what, what, what is happening to that group that puts them at such high risk of death? So I hope you all invite me so I can give a full lecture on why I think that bleeding matters and why is it associated with higher mortality. A most recent publication from these meta-analyses by Tulio Palmerini uh, showed actually that there was a close and clear causal relationship, almost uh, a, a relationship that you couldn't refute with um, bleeding and death. And we are working now in understanding time updated covariate adjusted analyses to see when a bleed happens, what are we doing? and what's happening to the, to the patient's risk of ischemic events after the bleeding event. We know that in bleeding patient population, and we've, uh, well, I've published a lot of this, for some reason we stop statins and beta blockers. What does that have to do with bleeding? But we stop that 
We're like, it's like no hands on this patient. We don't bring them back for needed revascularization procedures because we're afraid they might bleed again. We don't take care of them the way we should. They're, they're, that, those are unmeasured confounders, Dr. Kohler. We can't control everything in a clinical trial. We certainly can't control how clinicians are making decisions and doing other things outside of the clinical trial setting. But we do know that when there's a bleed, which usually occurs in the more frail, sicker patient population, that there is a clear association. Some of these bleeds are bleeding related. Some of these deaths are bleeding related deaths that can be easily adjudicated. Not easily. Nothing is easy to adjudicate, but to, to figure out. Others are due to this neglect of these patients, and others are due even to the patient's um, uh, ambivalence to undergo any kind of or take blood thinners again because it is a scary thing when you vomit two liters of blood. It's really scary and have to receive four or five units of blood uh, packed, packed cells. So we don't have the answer, but we're getting closer and closer. We've done a lot of analytics, but we do know that bleeding avoidance strategies has to be right up there with ischemic avoidance strategies. We can't just give carte blanche antiplatelet and anticoagulants to everybody. We've got to think. Thank you. Yes, thank you.